Hello everyone and welcome to week 7 of Applied Immunology. This week we will continue our week 6 discussion of methods that are used to characterize certain aspects of an immune response, although this week's lectures will be centered more on those methods that are used in clinical hospital settings for patient diagnostics. We will start today with lecture 7a, where we will discuss a handful of diagnostic tests that are commonly used in clinical labs including serological assays that are based on evaluating the presence or absence of various soluble immune-related molecules, as well as cellular assays, which are used to phenotype immune cell functions. Please take note that you only have two lectures for week seven. So there's this one and lecture 7b, which will discuss flow cytometric analysis of immune cells. So you should have a little bit of extra time um, to catch up on lectures or reading from week, week six this week that you may have missed last week if you were busy with focusing on the midterm. Let's jump right into learning about some new tests today, starting with something called a hemagglutination assay, which is used for ABO blood typing. This is a type of serological test, or one where you measure qualities of soluble factors present in a blood sample. Not surprisingly, serological assays involve sampling a small amount of serum from patient blood, which again is the yellowish liquid fraction that you collect from the top of a tube where blood has been allowed to clot and then spun down in a centrifuge. This plasma fraction contains soluble molecules, including antibodies. Now for reverse blood grouping, you take a few drops of plasma from a patient and mix them in a plate with red blood cells, or RBCs, that are either type A or type B. Remember that there are four blood types, A, B, a and B together, and O, or O negative, which has neither A or B. And all of these differ with respect to carbohydrate or sugar antigens that are displayed on their cell surface. Once serum and RBCs are incubated together for a short amount of time, you then observe what the well looks like macroscopically with the naked eye. This assay is easy because you're just looking for visual evidence of direct hemagglutination, which is just a fancy term for particles aggregating or clumping together when you mix antigen-expressing RBCs with antibodies that recognize those RBC antigens. If no patient antibodies recognize antigens expressed by the RBC type, then everything remains dispersed evenly throughout the well, and this is shown here on the case on the left, because no agglutination has occurred. However, if antibodies in the patient's serum do recognize and bind to antigens that are expressed by an RBC type, then the cells and antibodies clump together and look kind of grainy in the well and form these little dots, as you can see in this example on the right. The reason why this reaction occurs is due to B cell tolerance that we learned about in week five, since patients do not have antibodies that are specific for their own blood type. And this is because these B cells would have been considered autoreactive B cell clones that were removed during B cell development. However, patients do have antibodies with specificity for the sugar molecules expressed by RBCs from non-self blood types since these qualify as foreign antigens. So agglutination only occurs when patient antibodies are mixed with non-self blood types. Note that this form of testing is called reverse blood grouping, but you can also mix patient RBCs with either anti-A or anti-B antibodies and then look at hemagglutination. And in, in that case, um, the test would be called forward blood grouping. With this reasoning in mind, this chart from the textbook sums up the results of agglutination reactions across various combinations of patients with different blood types in the left column, where their uh, serum is mixed with target RBCs of different blood types across this top row. This shows reactions against both O RBCs, which express none of this type of carbohydrate antigen, as well as AB RBCs, which express a combination of both A and B surface antigens. But if you test serum reactivity with just A red blood cells and just B red blood cells, then this still allows you to determine which of the four, four blood types this patient has. Type O patients have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies, so their serum will clump together with RBCs from any other blood type, while type AB patients in the bottom row lack anti-A and anti-B antibodies, and so they won't display agglutination reactions with any other RBC type. Type A patient serum contains anti-B antibodies and will therefore clump together with any RBC type that expresses B antigen, while type B patient serum contains anti-A antibodies and will therefore clump with any RBC type that express A antigen. Note that people with type O blood are called universal RBC donors because their red blood cells express no surface antigens, so nobody has anti-O antibodies and therefore all patients can receive type O red blood cell transfusions. Conversely, People with type AB blood are called universal RBC acceptors because they are tolerant to both A and B antigens. 
So in the absence of anti-A and anti-B antibodies, they can receive any blood type of uh, RBC transfusions. Note that for serum compatibility, is uh, this is another component that's important for blood transfusions since it would be harmful to transfer in serum antibodies from a blood donor that would recognize a recipient's own blood cells. These are all important considerations to take into account when determining compatibility between donors and recipients for blood transfusions. Another type of agglutination-based serology assay is the Coombs test, which helps diagnose something called rhesus incompatibility in pregnant women. And this is a condition where a, a mother who doesn't express a red blood cell antigen called rhesus expresses anti-rhesus antibodies, but then she becomes pregnant with a newborn that does express rhesus protein on their red blood cells through paternal inheritance. Because maternal IgG antibodies are transported across the placenta, these maternal anti-rhesus IgG antibodies can then bind to rhesus-positive fetal red blood cells and tag them for destruction by phagocytosis. Therefore, if rhesus incompatibilities aren't diagnosed early on enough for proper interventions, then the fetus can develop a dangerous condition called hemolytic anemia of the newborn. And this is a situation where the fetus, or once um, they're born, the baby has dangerously low levels of fetal red blood cells that maybe need to, need to be addressed through blood transfusions or even induction of early labor for other types of treatments. Rhesus incompatibility is diagnosed by using a Coombs test, which can come in either direct or indirect forms depending on whether you sample fetal or maternal blood. In either case, a sample that contains both fetal red blood cells and maternal serum will be mixed together, so any maternal anti-rhesus antibodies can bind to rhesus-positive fetal RBCs. However, unlike with blood typing, rhesus protein is expressed at a lower density on the red blood cell surface, so it will not induce hemagglutination solely with anti-rhesus antibody binding. So these samples are incubated with another antibody that recognizes the FC region of human IgG, and this is shown here in purple, such as rabbit anti-human IgG. This allows RBC aggregation to occur if fetal RBCs are coded in maternal anti-rhesus antibodies, and this gives an experimental readout of agglutination that you can see by eye. This test allows for rhesus incompatibilities between mother and fetus to be diagnosed early on in gestation, and this allows you to uh, engage earlier therapeutic interventions that avoid the development of more serious or advanced forms of HDN. Like with blood typing, the Coombs test uh, doesn't help diagnose the immune status of a patient in response to something like infection or autoimmunity, but these are still good examples of tests that are performed in order to screen a patient's endogenous antibodies for potentially harmful reactivity. Next, let's learn about some clinical tests that are related to the infection or disease history of a patient. If you remember back to lecture 6b, we learned about sandwich ELISAs, which can be used to quantify the concentrations of soluble proteins or antigens in a sample. Another form of ELISA can be used for serology testing, which, rather than using a plate-bound capture antibody, uses a plate-bound capture antigen. And this uses the same principles of ELISAs in that the target or the presence of a target is read out through the enzymatic activity of an antibody-linked enzyme. But an important difference here is that we are testing for the presence of antibodies in a sample, not antigens. When applied to clinical samples like patient serum, this type of ELISA is how clinical labs test for things like anti-nuclear antibodies, which are abbreviated as ANA. And these are autoreactive antibodies that recognize nuclear cellular proteins. Elevated levels of ANAs are found in the serum of patients with several types of autoimmune diseases, including systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. So this is an important diagnostic readout for that uh, pathology. Notably, this is also the type of serological testing that is currently being used to confirm prior infections with SARS-CoV-2, as patients who were previously infected with the virus are assumed to have circulating SARS-CoV-specific antibodies in their blood, at least for a couple of months post-infection. The serology testing for SARS is therefore different than the molecular qPCR tests that are used to amplify viral nucleic acid. And those qPCR tests are much more indicative of an active viral infection and potential COVID symptoms, while the uh, serology assay looks at antibody production. Now in this type of ELISA, the antigenic epitope of interest is fixed onto a plate, and then a sample that you want to test for antibodies is incubated with that plate-bound antigen. Note that antigen selection here is very important. And so for example, with the SARS antibody testing, some of these test for different epitopes or parts of proteins that are expressed by the virus. 
So if a patient's dominant antibody response actually recognized a different target epitope than the one that's bound to the plate for a given serology test, then they might come up as being a false negative for prior episodes of infection. Uh, the sample well is then probed using a secondary antibody specific for the FC region of the target antibody, and uh, this is also linked to an enzyme. These are typically raised against IgG and IgM isotypes, since this is thought to cover both class-switched IgG and non-class-switched IgM isotypes. This should cover most antibodies that you would find circulating in blood, but keep in mind that there is another potential area for false negatives here if a patient had a different dominant antibody isotype response, such as IgA, that wouldn't be detected by an ELISA that uses a secondary uh, anti-IgG or anti-IgM antibody. A colorimetric substrate for the linked enzyme is then added to the well, and like with the sandwich ELISA, the saturation of color here is used as a surrogate readout for the presence of antibodies in the original patient sample. When paired with other protein quantification assays, this type of ELISA has applications for evaluating antibody titers following infection or vaccination, as well as autoimmune pathologies that are characterized by the presence of autoantibodies against various self-antigens. The last type of serology testing for soluble factors that we will discuss today is very straightforward, and that is just simply a quantification of serum antibody isotypes and complement pathway components. This type of protein quantification data could be obtained using something like an ELISA as well as some other techniques. And this table from the textbook presents expected ranges of concentrations for each aminoglobulin class that you would expect to find circulating in healthy individuals. Back when we discussed antibody functions in week five, I mentioned that IgG and IgA are the most abundant isotypes in circulation, particularly uh, IgG. And this is reflected in this table with their higher ranges. They are followed by IgM, which is present in slightly lower abundance than IgA, and lastly, IgE antibodies make up the lowest concentrations in circulation. Altered levels of antibody isotypes can be informative for a number of things, for example, in determining if a patient may have some mutations in antibody class switching pathways if they are deficient in certain isotypes, or if somebody may have an ongoing type of infection that would be reflected by increased levels of a certain antibody isotype in circulation. You can also quantify complement proteins in blood since these pathway components are found in high concentrations in serum. Again, altered values for complement pathway concentrations may be helpful in diagnosing defects in complement signaling or the presence of an ongoing infection. The second section of clinical diagnostics that we will talk about today are those that have to do with cellular phenotyping or the characterization of functional readouts for circulating immune cells. These types of assays may be paired with something called a complete blood count, abbreviated as CBC. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as a blood differential. And uh, CBC testing provides counts and relative proportions of different circulating leukocytes. CBCs are typically done using some combination of automated cell counting, as well as uh, manual microscopic examinations of blood smears. And although this provides some really important diagnostic information related to total leukocyte numbers, the functionality of circulating immune cells cannot be determined through running a CBC alone. In cases where a more serious or complicated diagnosis is suspected based off of CBC data, clinical labs can run a variety of functional tests on circulating immune cells, all of which require their isolation from blood. And this is accomplished by using something called density gradient fractionation. To do this, blood is diluted in a saline solution containing some sort of anticoagulant reagent like EDTA or heparin, and then this diluted blood is pipetted on top of a tube that contains a solution called FICOL. FICOL is a carbohydrate polymer that, when added to other reagents, provides a step gradient that will separate cells out based on their densities. So once a blood sample is added on top of the FICOL solution, the tube is then spun in a centrifuge, and different immune cell populations are separated out based on their density. Granulocytes, such as neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, have larger and therefore denser networks of nuclei, and so these all collect at the bottom of the tube along with red blood cells. These can be collected for analysis if necessary. But another important leukocyte fraction isolated through density centrifugation are those that only have one nucleus, and this includes things like T and B lymphocytes as well as monocytes. These peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which are abbreviated as PBMCs, are less dense, and so they collect kind of at the top of the gradient here in this tube. This table from the textbook provides a summary of expected concentration ranges for circulating myeloid cells. This includes monocytes as well as neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And 
Note that neutrophils are the most abundant circulating immune cell since they make up anywhere from 50 to 65% of leukocytes that are circulating in healthy individuals. Patient values that fall outside of these normal ranges for each cell concentration can be very helpful in suggesting certain types of diagnoses. For example, elevated numbers of eosinophils and basophils might reflect some type of parasitic infection, since these cell types are important for type 2 immune responses, while elevated numbers of neutrophils and monocytes could be indicative of some type of bacterial infection. Conversely, decreased numbers of circulating myeloid cells could suggest certain types of anemia or defects with, uh, in the, within the bone marrow, with the stem cells in the bone marrow. This information is an important preliminary diagnostic test for a clinician to consider before deciding which additional tests to order and conduct. The functionality of these cells is difficult to test in vivo, so density gradient centrifugation allows for the isolation of cell fractions containing monocytes or denser polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which once separated out can be subjected to different in vitro functional tests. These include assays to evaluate how well something like a neutrophil can phagocytose external material. You can do this by feeding it labeled beads or bacterial particles and examining cells using either a microscope or a flow cytometer. You can also test the ability of a neutrophil to kill intracellular bacteria using a variety of different methods. Lastly, the nitro blue tetrazoleum or NBT test evaluates the ability of neutrophils to phagocytose the dye NBT and then use their reactive oxygen species to reduce the dye, and this leads to a colorimetric readout. So in healthy neutrophils, ROS uh, reduce the dye and turn it blue, which can be evaluated under a microscope. However, in certain patients whose phagocytes have a defect in ROS production, the dye cannot be reduced, and so their phagocytes do not exhibit this color change in vitro. This is a common test used to screen for a primary immunodeficiency called chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD, and this is where patients typically have mutations and enzymes needed for the respiratory burst that generates ROS, and so these patients are highly susceptible to bacterial infections as a result. These types of functional assays can be performed using microscopic techniques or flow cytometry analysis, which we will discuss more in the next lecture for week seven. Note that there are many other functional assays that can be performed, and these depend on the immune cell type of interest and the selection of additional functional assays depends on the specific diagnoses that a clinician would like to test or rule out. Lastly, we can examine perturbations to T and B lymphocytes circulating in blood using several of the clinical techniques that we've discussed today. Again, CBC panels provide important preliminary information on the concentrations and relative frequencies of lymphocytes that are found circulating in blood, but note that this means that blood testing will not pick up on any alterations to non-circulating lymphocytes such as those that are resident in tissues, including primary and secondary lymphoid organs. This table provides expected ranges of concentrations for both T and B cells in the blood. After neutrophils, lymphocytes make up the next most abundant cell type circulating in blood. Increased numbers of certain lymphocytes could be associated with chronic infections or certain types of leukemias, while lymphocyte deficiencies in the blood could reflect issues with bone marrow stem cells, autoimmune disorders, or other types of infections and leukemias. The function of lymphocytes in vivo can start to be tested using some of the techniques that we've already covered, and this includes serological assays used for characterizing humoral immune responses through the concentration, specificity, and or the isotype of circulating antibodies. T-cell function can also be tested in vivo using certain types of skin tests, where a small amount of uh, pathogen-derived or pathogen-associated antigen is injected intradermally and skin swelling due to T-cell migration and reactivation is then re evaluated. Like myeloid cells, lymphocytes can be subjected to a wide variety of functional tests in vitro following their isolation from blood ex vivo. This includes extensive panels of phenotyping markers like transcription factors and cytokines that can be assessed through flow cytometry, which again we will discuss in more detail in the next lecture for week seven. Another important in vitro form of functional analysis involves culturing T or B cells ex vivo with compounds called mitogens, which can induce lymphocyte proliferation in an antigen-independent fashion. Some commonly used mitogens in the species that they are derived from are summarized in this table on the right, which includes a few compounds extracted from plants as well as bacterial LPS, which can induce B cell proliferation upon signaling through TLR4. Mitogens are helpful tools for a couple of reasons, uh, one being that they can test the ability of lymphocytes to proliferate, which is a key readout of T and B cell functionality once they become activated. Importantly, mitogens can also be used to expand large numbers of lymphocytes in vivo for use in additional tests, 
And this is helpful in being able to conduct many diagnostic tests with a single sample of PBMCs that were isolated from a patient. In this lecture, we've discussed some of the serological and cellular assays that can be used to characterize the phenotypes of soluble factors or immune cells that are present in clinical samples. And we've talked about how the information gained from these tests can be extremely helpful when trying to gather information that can be used to diagnose an underlying condition for a patient. The list of techniques and tools that we've gone over today is by no means exhaustive, and there are many other immune-based clinical tests. But I hope that by covering a few types of these in today's lecture, this has helped stress how our knowledge of the immune system can be applied to common diagnostic tools that are used in clinical settings. We started off today by talking about how hemagglutination assays can be used for ABO blood typing and the Coombs test for rhesus incompatibility, which again is uh, used with pregnant women. We also learned about how different forms of ELISAs can be used to test for the presence of serum antibodies with specificities to certain self or viral antigens. And these ELISAs can also be used to help quantify concentrations of circulating antibody isotypes or factors involved in the complement cascade. We also learned how CBC panels provide important information about the numbers and relative concentrations of immune cells found circulating in the blood, and how these can be isolated using a density gradient in order to then perform a variety of functional assays, and these specific assays depend on the cell type of interest. We will expand on this last point of leukocyte functional phenotyping in the second and final lecture for week 7, where we will learn more about a powerful technique called flow cytometry.